talk to you about the EMA rate, and then we talked about just one graph, like one sample of, of tissue. Can you add multiple set of samples of tissue to increase the, the magnitude of the rate? Um, well, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, we, we take from the cortex, so it's particularly the adaptable part of the brain, if you like, where the neurons are not, originally this is what they do, so they're quite adaptable. So it's a particular region of the brain rather than generally, but at any one time we will have maybe 25 of those brains on the go, so we're making direct comparisons, but they are two-dimensional, and as such we have about... 100,000 to 150,000 brain cells, which is relatively powerful, but nothing like the 100 billion brain cells in the brain. But now we're also culturing, which is I think what you're, you're talking about there, we're culturing in three dimensions. So growing the brain in three dimensions, which takes, which for me is great, because it takes the numbers up to about 30 million. You know, it is starting to get quite a powerful brain. And remember, I said before, these can be rat neurons, but also we have human neurons. So we're talking there about 30 million human neurons in a robot body. So as well as looking at it from a medical robotics point of view, it also starts to, you know, ethical questions as well. Because this is living tissue in a technological body. If it's 30 million, fine, but if it's one billion, or, you know, should I be able to switch it off? Should it start to have voting rights and things like that? Um, you know, it, w what does it make to be a human? You know, if, if I have a hundred billion cell, okay, that's speculating a little bit, but what if there are a hundred billion of these cells, neurons, brain cells, in a robot body, there's only a hundred billion in a human brain. So what's the difference? Is it, you know, is the body means you've got to have this type of body to be a human? Uh, and what does this creature, does it have rights or not? So I, I think there are not just philosophical issues, but real issues that we will have to deal with before too long. That's, um, that's, a, that's a cool question, actually. That's a field, a field that's sort of related to haptics, which is using the sense of touch in computing. Um, as it stands at the moment, because the prostheses that I showed you earlier on, the one that, we can, the, the one that can be sold and attached to people um, as, a, as an actual piece of prosthesis, it doesn't have any sensors to, to deal with texture or to deal with any form of surface that you touch. So while you'll be able to, while you actually see that you're touching it, you, you won't feel it. And that's sort of something that they want to bring into prostheses so that you can have these sensors on the ends of your fingers and you can feel certain textures and, and surfaces and, and feel that you're actually touching something. But to do that, we need to be able to implant into the nervous system in a way that Kevin mentioned earlier on to do with connecting directly to your brain and being able to send those signals up into your system. So at the moment, no, but hopefully so, soon. But in terms of research projects, yes, is the answer. But I think there so far has only been one research project to do it, which was ours. So in the, in the United States at the moment, they have put the same implant into people, um, but not with the sort of feedback that you're talking of. And in this picture, that's me in Columbia University in New York. And what we did was plug my nervous system into the internet and link to the robot hand which you were looking at and probably be able to just about see on the computer and the robot hand was in Reading in, in England. So what I was doing was moving my hand in New York, my brain signals also moved the robot hand in England and the robot hand has those sensors on the fingertips and signals were sent back across the internet to stimulate my nervous system. So my brain was getting pulses of current which increased in frequency the, the tighter the grip on, the, on the, whatever the, the robot hand was holding. So I could feel, not texture or anything technically, but could just feel how much force the robot hand was applying, how much pressure it was applying to objects. So that you can do and can operate it very accurately is the point. So it will be possible for people with, who've had their hand amputated to actually feel things like force I, I think it would be di very difficult to get very fine 
texture, sort of play darts or something like that could be quite difficult. But suddenly how much force is being applied, how much the hand is gripping, yes. The, the guy behind you, if you could pass the microphone to the... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good, awkward questions. So. <laughs> how, many, how many lines of code would be done to those walkers there, those might you there? there, there These? Oh, yeah. I don't know how many is on them um, uh, particularly, but I know that normal mobile robotic stuff, you could probably do it with... Do you, do you program at all? Um, yeah, I'm so, doing it for a So course. pretty much anything to do with um, taking data from outside and putting it back in, you can do with a for loop, okay? So you run it constantly. Because it's a microchip, it's, it, you code it a little bit differently, and you run it with things like interrupts. So maybe to do something like that, so that it just detects an object, maybe about 20 lines of code or so, to learn and to, to memorize things and remember where stuff is and what not to do, probably another 50. So, and then you've got all the setup of the thing. So if you run that, the executable program may be probably less than 100 lines of code. But to set up the robot with the, um, to, to set up all the interrupts and things like that and how you configure your, your sensors and your, um, your microcontroller, that's maybe another 200, but just because it's fine detail and you have to tell it exactly how you want things to be. But in terms of an actual executable program, less than 100 lines. But it does depend on, if you're getting them to learn, how you want them to learn. What these things do is they, they're effectively picking up what sort of situation they're in. So is there an object on the left or the right? Or so exactly where are they with regard to objects? And then they will have a number of things they can do in that situation. And they will then use what's called a weighted roulette wheel. So it starts off with, or spins the wheel, and it could do this, or it could do that, dependent on where the wheel stops. If it's successful, so in this case, if it moves around and doesn't bump into things, then that's more likely, the, the weighting on that particular slot on the wheel gets bigger. So next time, it's more likely to do that. If it crashes into the wall, then that slot gets smaller, and so it becomes less likely to do that. That's just the, so that's how this is learning. So it, has, it spins the wheel, it will try this, whatever, whatever the wheel stops. If it's good, it's more likely next time. If it's bad, it's less likely next time. So, but it's not complex code, but it does, normally it does work, except for when Chris is demonstrating it. So. <laughs> It's um, in stereo. Yeah. Robot with the brain tissue, how, I mean, you said it, you set it to always turn right. How do you sort of set brain to always turn right? Right. Um, very good. These are good questions, actually. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to show. Um, on the, the, ah, there we are. That's what I'm looking for. So we've got the brain growing in the dish here. After about 10 days, we will pull round, so we will apply a pulse here, and we will apply a pulse here, and we'll apply a pulse here, and we will see when we apply a pulse here, within a few milliseconds, where do we get a response? So let us assume, for example, I apply a pulse on this particular electrode, zing, 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 that will stimulate the brain, pathway through the brain, maybe a few milliseconds later, we will get a response here. And that happens 20% of the time. So what it means is there is some pathway through the brain that has developed to some extent that when you stimulate it in a certain way, this happens. So what we do is take that and say, right, now we link it to the robot body. So when we get an ultrasonic signal, it will then stimulate the brain in this way, zing, 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 through the brain, and this output will be used to change the direction of the robot. So we've created that feedback loop. And the beautiful thing is, every time that feedback loop is energised, the links between the brain cells get stronger. 
This is a process called Hebbian learning, Donald Hebb back in 1949. And to actually see it happening under the microscope is so exciting. You know, you see the transition that these, you think, oh, the brain is this magic thing. And when you start looking, you think, well, it's not really, it's a physical thing. This brain cell fires, causes that brain cell to fire, causes that brain cell to fire, and you've got a pathway through the brain. And every time that happens, it all gets a bit bigger. And it's, it does it slow over a period of time. But that's exactly what learning is about. And this is, but this is like habitual learning. So that, that's what we do. We sort of pinch a way that it's developed and then let that develop and grow and develop and grow until, as you saw with that robot after two months, gets the stimulus, that's what it does. It sort of boom, it responds automatically, which what ha what's happened with older people, you know, you, you tell them this, you know, do this, and right, that's it, and they'll, they'll do it without thinking about it. You know, vote Labour. No, I'm not going to vote Labour, or whatever it happens to be. It's just an automatic response they've learnt over many, many years. There's, um, like, AI in modern video games that's uh, built up around the idea of uh, repeat actions, say, where they understand how to take cover and to try and preserve themselves for a longer period. Is there any research that's going into the creation of, say, robot soldiers or something like that? Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you want to say anything on the video games? Apart from being a three-star Mario Kart,er uh, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not so much into the AI. Um, a few years ago, when there was a game when I was in school uh, called Quake 2, oh, yeah. Just, yeah, and a guy I think it was about eight years ago, set up a server that he could put some AI characters onto it. And he left them there. He just wanted to see what would happen if he put a load of AI characters in and see how they would deal with lots and lots of different um, kinds of AI characters. And so when he initially watched them, they shot each other and they died and then they came back to life and they did all this sort of thing. And he kind of thought nothing else of it. And it was only a couple of years ago that he thought, hang on a minute, I've left this server running for so long. What's happened to it? went back to it and it turns out that these things have learned that the best thing to do is just to stand there and do nothing. So they don't attack each other, they don't run around, they don't do anything. And it's like, well that's a bit strange, but that makes sense, right? Because if you, if, if you coded your AI up to go, if he shoots at me then I'll run away, or if I shoot at him then he's probably going to shoot back, so I won't do anything. All it's trying to do is preserve itself in its best possible way. So yeah. he went back and found they all just stood there and did nothing. So they've mastered peace before we have, right? <laughs> so, he then thought, well, what happens, what happens they're a little bit more intelligent, why wouldn't they? You know? He then thought, well, what happens if I invade their space and try and take some of their land and shoot them? Well, what happens was all four of them turned around and shot him and left him alone. And then after that, left each other alone. Because if you shot the new person, nothing would happen and it would all stay peaceful and lovely. In terms of robot soldiers, I don't think we're quite there yet because you still have to work out the control and the ethics that go with that. Um, there is research into enhancing soldiers, but only in the sense of making them be able to run faster. Is there any way that they could like implant similar AI to what is currently being used in games to make them work in a similar way? I know it's a bit far-fetched. Well, if, if I can interject here, I don't think what Chris is telling you is it depends what you're calling a robot soldier. Um, because at the moment what we do have are drones. They're referred to as drones. So this is not, they don't look like humans, they're flying machines, but with an awful lot of firepower on them. Now, most of them work autonomously from the point that once they've been given their mission, they will go out and satisfy that mission. And the human controller very rarely has any input to that unless the mission is aborted. So the, the, the drone will go out and do... And it will be receiving information. I think the, uh, the, the prime example I added a few years ago, when it homed in on a, a cell phone that was being used and literally you know, went in on it like a, um, a, a line of sight uh, missile and just went in and killed the people in the car where the cell phone was being used. Uh, now that type of system can very easily and is being given certain aspects of artificial intelligence. It depends how much you include adaptability in that as Chris said, there are all sorts of ethical questions, but I don't know that the military themselves are particularly worried uh, too much about some of the ethics that we might be. And there are people that are, are concerned about that. 
You know, it, it's one thing having a human looking for you and coming to, to find you, but when you do get a, a sort of a real life Terminator that, if you like, has an initial program, go and destroy this person or this, no matter what you do, you can't get away from it, yeah. then it, it starts to get a little bit worrying. So there are questions, uh, and Chris is right to raise the ethical issue, but I, I think at the moment the military are perhaps overstepping some of those, uh, ignoring some of the worries that people might have. There is a, um, a lot of research going on on the use of AI in game systems. There's a whole journal now, I trebly transactions uh, on computer intelligence AI in games. That's, uh, you know, so it's a whole research area in universities that you might be interested in looking at. So AI in games is a very uh, interesting area. Get out of that. Um, <laughs> there are two answers to <laughs> How, uh, Can you read? Are you any good at reading? Uh, a bit. A bit, okay. Well, I, before now, we had a, um, a present for the, 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 the ultimate... Uh, so there we go. I, I'll give you, I've got another book. So the, you can't, I'm not giving you a robot, but I'll give you a book which talks about the robot. Is that... How's that? Will that do for now? Okay, thank you very much. But thank you very much, thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody, thank you very much. Have a nice Christmas, I hope you get the presents you want. Thank you Chris.